And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple. A man who asks and answers the simple question, is it pronounced Dr. Stein or Dr. Steen? Dr. Stein. Dr. Stein. <laughs> but he, d unfortunately, he does not make funny creatures that go on to become <laughs> great rock musicians. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Chuck Huber. How are you doing today, man? Hello. I'm doing good. How are you? How are you, monk? I am do I'm doing good. I apologize for making a Halloween joke, but I had to get that one out of my system. <laughs> Oh. Plus, I plus I remember when I first saw Soul Eater, I ended up making that joke every single time, <laughs> because <laughs> before because well, young Frankenstein. Right, Frankenstein, <laughs> Frau Bucher. <laughs> it's the best. Yeah. one of the best movies mm -hmm. of all time for sure. Now, one of the traditions around here, aside from the drinking, which surprises some people because. Mo because monks drink. I don't know why that's such a shock. They make beer. Yeah, especially over in Belgium. That's right. But Chimay Ale, mm -hmm. one of the one of the great beers. Yeah. But I usually open up with the humble traditions, the origin story, and I suppose I suppose since I since I opened it up in, with this angle with um, Spike and with a few others. I would I would like to I would like to kind of get the get the gist on how you first got exposed to this weird and wonderful world that is the world of anime. Yeah, so when I was a kid, we watched <clears throat> Speed Racer, G-Force, Battleship Yamamoto. Mm -hmm. um, that was about it. Those were all the ones I saw as a child. And we didn't know them as anime, and back then it was called Japanimation. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't called anime yet. And uh, we, I, as a kid, I just knew them as the better cartoons. Well, they were different cartoons. They were cartoons that told stories instead of cartoons that I now know, uh, you know, were based in vaudeville. So uh, all the Looney Tunes stuff is basically animated vaudeville gags. Mm -hmm. uh, so I knew them to be, you know, cartoons that were telling stories in a different way. So I uh, didn't really... In, encounter the word anime until I was in college and there was a video store and it had a whole uh, well part of a section of a wall that was titled anime and we used to you know Friday or Saturday nights uh, you know go rent some anime and sit around with friends and 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 watch anime uh, uh, friends I'm still friends with to these days mm -hmm. uh, to this day which is awesome uh, you know, 30 years of friendship and also still watching anime with them. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my exposure to anime proper. And I remember the first one that blew my mind was Akira. Mm -hmm. And that movie just expanded my vision of what, you know, animation could do storytelling wise. So that was amazing for me. And then uh, I had a career in Chicago for 10 years, TV, film, and theater. Uh, went to the theater school at DePaul University mm -hmm. and then um, moved to Texas and started a, th a theater company. And one of my buddies came into rehearsals one day and he was like, hey, you should go audition for this Dragon Balls thing. And I was like, Dragon Balls? That sounds like porn. And he was like, no, it's Japanese anime. And I was like, okay, so it's definitely porn. <laughs> he was like, no, it's cool. And I was like, all right, all right, I'll check it out. So I called um, Chris, Sa he gave me Chris Sabat's number mm -hmm. and uh, I gave him a call and he was like, yeah, man, come on in, audition. And I auditioned, first thing I auditioned for was um, Garlic Jr. Mm -hmm. And I literally did the audition. And then he's like, oh man, that was awesome. You're great. Do uh, you got time to like record it right now? <laughs> and I was like, yes, yes I do. You mean I got the part? And he was like, yeah. Yeah, man, totally, it's you. So I recorded it. I uh, recorded for like two hours right after auditioning, which was different, mm -hmm. <laughs> to say the least. That's not normally how these things go. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, it was uh, just a lot of fun. 
and really casual. And I was like, okay, so this may be a scam because it was real it kind of rinky dink at the beginning. You know, the mm -hmm. studio was not uh, the fancy studios they have now is kind of that looked, it was more like a makeshift studio you might find in someone's garage. Mm -hmm. uh, super pro booth, super pro microphone, but everything else, all the furniture, you know, plastic table with a, a, a rug or a, a blanket thrown over it. Um, you know, a music stand with a t-shirt uh, paper clipped to it, you know, to keep the script from making noises against the uh, uh, music stand. So it was, it was very uh, bare bones to start. And uh, until I got paid, I, I was convinced that it was just a scam. And then they sent me a check and I was like, okay, I guess it's real. Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess I'm doing this and uh, I've been doing it ever since. That'd be almost... Gosh, I don't know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. 25 years ago. That's crazy. And I will always have a, a bit of a soft spot for the, for certain certain time periods when it comes to when it comes to anime and, and especially when it comes to being able to access it, because even though it was slightly before my time, I've had my I've had my fair share of horror stories be relayed to me about the early days of tape trading. <laughs> yeah tapes isn't that funny i mean all the way back then when people had vhs tapes it was definitely a very different uh uh a very different culture because you you know you couldn't watch it on your phone mm -hmm. you couldn't watch everything everywhere all the time whenever you wanted so it was uh you know i i don't want to say it, it was more special back then but there is something to scarcity that that breeds, um, you know, sort of a, uh, a, you know, when something's a little scarce, you you respect it a little more. I'd say so. some, something that has been affected over the years has been the so, has been the social event effect. Is I'm calling I'm calling it to try and pretend that I'm somewhat professional at this, even though I'm definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> I am professionally unprofessional, but. Sure. That, but just that notion of of a of a certain sh of a certain show being discussed at the water cooler, or or the or the coffee table, depending on your office, and yes. and ju and just bring just bringing people together through that. I I remember when I was in high school, I kind of contributed to that because I was the only one in my group of friends that had um that had cable. So oh wow yeah what I so what I would do is I is I would um I would do timed recordings of Toonami and then later on Adult Swim um and and then I then I'd go over to a, I, we'd all go over to a friend's place who had a better TV for it and and watch over there okay so that, just that just that kind of experience of bringing people together I've been. I've been trying to bring that in my own form with with the watch parties I do I do in my temple for a thing I call the Parliament of Geeks. That's good. That's good. That's good. There is there is a bit of that missing now because everybody can watch it solo. There's a lot more people watching it solo whereas before once again that scarcity bred community mm -hmm. because if only one guy had the tapes everybody had to go to that guy and that, you know, I mean, that's eventually how the anime conventions started, you know, because they started with gaming groups and, and watch groups. And um, and that's really uh, I don't I don't say it's, it's obviously not missing because there's more anime conventions and more groups than ever. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that's uh, it's not like the the community is suffering at all. But there's a little bit of that. Um, I don't know. It was. I don't want to be one of those guys who's like it was better when there were less of us. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> there's no no need to be a grog. Yes, yes exactly. Um, yeah. I think that's the reason why I've had such a love for tabletop gaming because you that whole that whole isolation thing that we've been talking about. It is physically impossible to do to to do much of table t much of the likes of tabletop RPGs or board games and the like solo it's possible it's true but it is a very very um tr it's a very very bottlenecked experience yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Table uh, gaming game, tabletop gaming still requires, and it's something that I, 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 I don't, uh, I, I encourage my children in different directions, but you never want to be a parent who's like, I'm requiring you to do this thing, but it would really, uh, I would really only be able to do tabletop gaming if my children did it because uh, otherwise I would spend too much time away from them, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's, it's a, uh, 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 you know, they take a long time. You got to put in hours to make that happen. And I couldn't see myself spending like 20 hours away from my, you know, children yeah. playing games every uh, uh, month. Um, yeah. It's different. But, uh, you know, we still play games, uh, just ones that are shorter. Yeah. And, Rummy Cube and some other ones. And, well, the, the beauty the beauty of it is, is, is much like how there's something for everyone when it comes to anime, there's something for everyone when it comes to tabletop if some if somebody wants something that's a bit lighter and a bit more streamlined there's hero kids if somebody wants something that is very 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 simulationist then that's covered and when it comes to genres that's that you can just throw a name at a dartboard and i can probably i could probably find something that it fit <laughs> yeah it's funny because back in the day like way, way back in the day, I remember when Dungeons and Dragons came out mm -hmm. and uh, my friend Dean Kaplan was the first person to have people over to play D&D. &D. And it was just uh, like graph paper was interesting. You know, suddenly I was like, uh, and, and you know, we were ma you'd make your own character sheets. You know, they didn't have pre- uh, template character sheets that, that you'd have to make your own on notebook paper mm -hmm. or on blank paper. And so, you know, it, it was, it was, that was the only one it seemed. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, uh, you know, a couple more came out and then, then an explosion started happening, but it was, uh, you know, it was super niche at the beginning, but a lot of fun. I remember I got, um, I have a weird relationship with Dungeons and Dragons because, uh, my mom was okay with it and then she became like an evangelical christian instead of a catholic and uh so then we ended up you know she bought us a bunch of stuff for uh, christmas one year i got like a player guide and the, the handbook and um uh my brother got some stuff like my, my brother and i made a list so that we could be geared up mm -hmm. and we got it one christmas and we got to play for a year, a little less than a year. She became, you know, pretty uber Christian. And then she literally took all our stuff and burned it in the in the backyard. And it was like, <laughs> I remember being like, well, well, I don't understand what's happening. Why can't we play this game anymore? It's just a game. I ended, and, up, uh, I ended up going down a rabbit hole years ago, trying to find the origin point of a lot of of a lot of that hysteria. Yeah, the satanic panic mm -hmm. back then, and it was based in reality. The finders and there were a bunch of uh, human trafficking organizations that were, um, you know, prevalent back then and stealing kids. And there was there was a lot of bad stuff happening. But then they divert it and say it's be this there was one story where one guy murdered a kid in a drainage ditch or something and he blamed it on dungeons and dragons and said that you know the devil and dungeons and dragons made him do it or something stupid and uh that's then all the news media was like dungeons and dragons is bad and i was like no it's that not. was um in i know i know what you're referring to and that's that's not that's not a hundred percent of the story. Wait, tell me what's the what's the rest of the story? So that's what I remember as a nine year old yeah. or a ten year old, when however old I was. That's what I recall. So what's the rest of it? I've never looked into it. A lot, a lot of this, a lot, a lot of this ended up being the impetus for the inf for the infamous film Mazes and Monsters, <laughs> which right. I'm pretty sure is the one film that if I ever mentioned that to Tom Hanks, he'd probably give me the stink eye. <laughs> but I be I believe I believe the kid I believe the kid's name was J was James Dallas Egbert. Okay. And that sounds familiar. He he ended up he ended up disappearing. His family hired a private investigator. Um 
James was an avid was an avid player of of D, of D and D, but he had a whole lot more problems. He did he did he did um t- he did take his own, he did take his own life, and at the request of J- of James, a lot of the a lot of the bigger material material and a lot of the truth of the matter was withheld for a while because James's fear was that his was that his little brother would end up getting bullied over it. Cause oh wow okay there there what there was one there was one other story in involving involving this kind of thing and in both in both of these in both of these stories you had some you had people who weren't exactly um a full a full a full set of eggs if you catch my drift <laughs> they uh they were they were in the boat the boat was in the lake but they were only using one oar yeah that's 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 a new that's a new one but i'll take it and <laughs> eventually the eventually the whole thing with with james was put was um cataloged in the book mazes and monsters which was adapted into the film i have seen the film the film sucks <laughs> yes. and yes it does i've seen it too it's it was it was one of those things where where you you essentially had a grapevine effect, and one of the really early false rumors I remember was that there were these secret meet there were these secret meetings of D and D players in in steam tunnels and and sewers. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather play a game in a in a nice com- comfortably air comfortably air conditioned room than in a st- than in a mucky ass sewer. No, nobody was playing in sewer. That, that that wouldn't even work. How would you play in? That's the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it is it is definitely dumb. But it's one of those things I I always I always pointed I was pointed laugh at because oh because of how ridiculous they they were. One of the one of the best was the claim that D that um the designers of D and D contacted a real world Satanist, um. Then I lo- then I looked into it and I found that 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 the guy that su- that this supposedly was originated from is a fucking loon. <laughs> there's there's no way to put it. He he claimed that he was a witch high priest of Alexandrian tradition. There's no such thing. Right. That sure. that the that some representatives from TSR had contacted him to see if the rituals were authentic. Except you look at the date and the, and he claimed this in 1979, um, and that D and D was already out for a few years by that point. So so that so that kind of puts a hole into the into the whole thing, and yeah. the results in one of his books called "Should a Christian Play D and D?" He claimed that the Cthulhu mythos is real. I'll just <laughs> I'll just leave you with that. <laughs> <laughs> so could be. I don't know. I mean, I've heard weirder things. <laughs> yeah, it's just he also he also claimed that he, that um that he that he had des- he had designed a trapezoidal coffin to achieve quote demonic vampiric resurrection and claimed that that was the same coffin that the that the pope was in. <laughs> like I said, perfect. Like I said, it it's it was an absolute riot to to read it, but it's a case of. This is this is your best source for this whole real world occultist thing. <laughs> somebody who is cl- somebody who is clearly clearly off his tits. <laughs> well, I mean, and that the, I mean anything. Listen, there's bad juju in the world. I'm not I'm not knocking bad juju. I think you know we should all be careful about bad juju. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what that means, but I mean, you know, you know, there's bad stuff in the world, and there's there's systems and people that use you know, occult symbols, occult logic, occult control, manipulation, uh, Dungeons and Dragons isn't one of them. It's like, my, I remember when someone was, so they were trying to say Pokemon meant pocket monster and they were satanic demon things. And I was like, that's, that's kind of dumb. Yeah. I mean, like, my, my response, my response whenever these kind of things would come up was to use their words and make parody out of it. Because yeah, that's probably that's the best way. Mocking people is the quickest way to get them uh, delegitimized. There's, that's for sure. there's a there's a quote there's a quote from Mark Twain that's a, that's attributed to him. So whether or not he said it is up for debate. But the whole against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's true. It's true. What are you going to do? You can't. You can't. Uh, as soon as someone's laughing at you, they're they're dismissing you. So mm -hmm. you, you have no effect on them. Yeah. If, if you make someone angry that they win, mm -hmm. the, you've won. If, if you've made them angry then you've defeated them. Well, I I do know so. I do know that Plato had had state had stated in some of his work that any anybody can be anybody can be angry, that's easy, but being angry for the right reasons is not easy. Right reason, right time, right amount. Mm -hmm. Now, I have I some one particular I guess phenomena that I find interesting is the transition between one between one medium of performing into another um okay and in the case of in the, in the case of doing doing like stage or t or tv or film and then doing voice acting were there were there any habits that you had to kind of work your way, work your way out of um no i mean uh the the deal with voice acting is it's probably the easiest type of acting there is and i've done all of it i've done industrials i've done commercials i've done film mm -hmm. i've done television i've done stage i've done i've done pretty much everything and uh the the ease of voice acting is is predicated on the idea that you don't have to memorize anything your lines are right there in front of you and you uh, can dress however you want. The takes are short, so you're not doing like really, really long takes or anything. You're just, uh, you know, a couple lines, maybe five or six lines, if you're a super pro. Um, so the, it's 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 easy. And then Japanese animation comes out of a kabuki tradition. Mm -hmm. So there's a an extreme nature to the uh, the acting sometimes, oh, you know, mm -hmm. that's sort of like, um, I don't know, I don't know the intonation that yeah. they use. Yeah, I've... It's, it's very strong. So that's, that's probably mm -hmm. something I had to, I had to wrestle with, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of like, um, well, how is the, you know, and, and, but the most of that comes from listening to the Japanese seiyu and, um, you know, matching their, uh, sort of, level their their level of emotional tension you know so that you're you're finding yourself lifted to the heights that they're lifted to mm -hmm. and it is funny you it is funny you bring up um kabuki because a lot i've noticed a lot of a lot of folk even folk who claim to be um experts when it comes to discussing anime don't bring up the relationship between japanese theater and um anime and yeah, it's interesting, right? I al I always whenever I have to explain kabuki to people, I always tell people to think of it as some th think of it as have as having a similar psychology and presentation, although not word for word obviously, to a professional wrestling match. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, you know, it's funny. I uh I often equate Dragon Ball Z as uh, animated professional wrestling mm -hmm. really clear good guys really clear bad guys power up power up mm -hmm. different moves the whole thing is very much professional and that's why there's that sort of crossover between the two genres in terms of you know like we literally have wrestling at the japanese uh anime convention yeah now. so it's like it's obviously the same crowd and getting excited about it so obviously one of the obviously one of the biggest cases of crossover in that in that sort of sense is stuff like kaiju big battle and um chikara when it when it was running on the on the east coast oh. i'm not familiar with those so i can't make any intelligent statement kaiju big battle <laughs> was was it was and is this this gl this glorious parody of sh of Showa era to Togusats, especially obviously the ka the kaiju stuff, a la Godzilla, Gamera, that kind of thing. Right, right, right. Um, just just played up to just played up to ridiculous. Even having um, fake buildings in the middle of the ring to make it look to make it look like the sets from a Toho movie. <laughs> um, 
That's fun. And Chikara has has ha- has had these very colorful comic book esque um her- heroes and villains th- throughout its work. The the other th- the other thing I find especially funny with Dragon Ball with um Dragon Ball as a whole, oddly enough, has to tie to its origins because some in I remember when I re- I remember reading the manga and it had these excerpts from fan mail that Toriyama had gotten. And somebody pointed out. Oh, interesting. Somebody pointed out in one of them that there's a bit of a analog. There's a bit of an analogousness early on to Journey to the West, and I'm not just referring to the na- having the, having your titular character be Son Goku, which is the Japanese name of Son Wukong, the Monkey King. Right. right. But right, right, right. the fact that you could make an analogy of Bulma to Genjo Sanzo. Um, the Eternal Dragon to Sanzo's horse, um, Oolong to Hakai, and and so on. And okay. basically asking if the, if the if this was an if Dragon Ball was an attempt to do um, Journey to the West, and early on it was, but in Toriyama's own words, he forgot. <laughs> uh... But the D- the DNA is st- the DNA is still there, and well, Journey to the West is one of is one of the four is one of the four great classics when it comes to Wuxia and Tiansha, uh, the martial hero and the immortal hero. Okay. So it's it's always you, you're very well read <laughs> in all this. It's very fun to listen yeah, to. I um. <laughs> I spent I spent way too much time in libraries and bookstores. I was that I was that kid who would go into a library a library at like ten a.m. and I wouldn't leave until ten o'clock. Nice, nice. Um, that's the way to do it. Uh, I kind of miss those days. And I, I and I when I first started getting access to the net, I treated it as this giant sca- this giant scavenger hunt for me. Oh yeah, yeah, that was really fun. Did you ever use the the website called stumble upon do you remember this i've used it a few times yeah yeah it's gone now but they used to i used to spend hours just stumbling from website to website Mm -hmm. because it would just kind of you could pick a topic you know entertainment and you'd stumble website to website and then you'd pick a different one and uh that was always really fun it was it was like a scavenger yeah and Speaking on the on the on the tra- on the transfer between between mediums, um, just to, just as a bit of contrast, I remember a few years ago I was at MetroCon and I got to speak with um, with David Matranga. And, oh yeah, David's a good dude. And um, which it, he he ended up marking out when I get, when I presented a copy of Orphan for him to for him to sign, but. He he had he had talked about how one of the directors at at ADV was was telling him that he needed to amp amp things up because he the way he described the way he described the experience he was doing he was doing voice set he was doing his lines but he was doing them as if he was on as if he was um in front of a camera doing te- doing uh still doing commercials because that's what he was doing before that right and the and. He didn't say which director, but somebody had said, "Come on, cartoon boy, you got to amp it up." <laughs> <laughs> that is true. You do have to amp it up a little yeah. bit. There's a little bit of extra oomph that needs to come through, for sure. And <laughs> especially since, well, when you're in front of a camera or on a stage, you you have your body language to kind of fall back on, but in voice acting, true. you've just got your voice and nothing else. That's true. So that's true. You, you, uh, and and once again, I also think it comes from the the Kabuki tradition because they were just those edges of the intonation were always so far away. Yeah, a lot of that is to to uh, differentiate itself from no, which is the complete opposite. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. And the the those sort those sorts of extremes makes for makes for an interesting contrast because yeah there's anime that are a bit they're a bit more subdued but only to a point like no is extremely subtle you're not you're not even going to see that much colorfulness you're going to see a whole lot of black which is why um kurokos are are a thing in um japanese theater 
basically stagehands that wear all black and have a black veil in front of their face. Right, right. And the the rule of the rule of course with them is that they're meant to be extras slash stagehands, so they don't talk, ever. Right. But were the were is there any instance you can think you can think of of a of a very long session, and how how did you how did you manage to keep your vo- uh, maintain your voice throughout that kind of session? Well, if it's not, and I've been blessed with a lot of characters that don't uh, scream a lot, mm-hmm. so uh, I've never really had any issue, other than there may have been one or two times when I was sick that sessions started to, to dwindle out a little bit. Um, but I'd, uh, uh, I'd say the place where it really comes into play, and it can come into play pretty quickly, is doing video games where there are you know, fighting reactions, because mm-hmm. those fighting reactions tend to take a, a a toll on the voice more, especially the deaths. If you die uh, in multiple different ways, it can become... There was a, a one I did called Blood Rain, mm-hmm. and obviously just by the name, you can hear that. The, the, I, I think I had two, two or three sheets filled with different death reactions. <laughs> so there were just a lot of ways to die in that video game. And it all involved sort of hurting your throat. And I do remember when I did that, I had to go. Uh, I had to call the session. I was like, I'm not. I got nothing left. And we had, we had to schedule it for like to finish up like three or four days later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, mostly video games is where that hurts, at least for me. I know there are other people who have characters that uh, <clears throat> are taxing on their voice. Uh, but luckily, for whatever reason, I don't get cast in those. Probably because my voice doesn't do that. My voice pretty much does this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which is so, which is pro- is probably for the best. It's not, you're not going to have a situation where you've got like a bo- you got like a bottle of honey ne- next to, next to the mic or something like that. Yeah, no, we t- we typically. I mean, you can do a little bit of the tea and honey and the other stuff, but generally speaking, once your voice starts to shred. There's not much you can do for it except to rest. Yeah, I um, I I end up I end up destroying my voice more often than not. Be, being a being a G, being a GM for some for some games, especially superhero games. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure I can see that. Because well, with I'd say I'd say with a session you're you're probably you're probably only in there for a, for maybe a maybe a couple hours. No, probably no more than four hours in one go. If I had to guess. Yeah, that's pretty correct. Whereas, with some campaigns, especially the ones I've d- I've done that involve multiple tables, um, I've had I've had to do I've had I've had I had one case where I was I was GMing for like seven hours, <laughs> wow. seven hours doing that... doing a bunch of different voices all by myself and a bunch of different accents all by myself. I had I had th- I had this big fuck off liter of tea on on the table. Behind the GM screen, I would just go, I would just go through that. I one time did a, a a play, and it was a two person play, no intermission, about an hour and a half on stage, and I was sick, super sick, and my voice was gone, and so we added in a a hot pot of tea on the set, and so I got to drink tea. And it was different because I was I was uh, um, <laughs> I was not you know I rehearsed not drinking tea, but suddenly I had this teapot that I could go to when I needed. Mm-hmm. So it changed the whole tenor of the 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 performance. And also, my voice was uh, rather weak, so I wasn't able to to go for it. So you had to find as an actor, you just have to find different ways to accomplish what you want to accomplish with. Um, you know your limitations which is what the human in that case would have to do mm-hmm. anyway so you just still behave yeah and if your voice doesn't work it just doesn't work so you just have to make it work as best you can though i do i do remember getting called up by a friend of mine saying hey hey we need an extra gm for for one of the for one of the bigger sessions can can you help out i was like how big we're talking and he's he's like we've got 15 players and i said fuck you i'm not doing that and i hung up i'm like <laughs> 
<laughs> having to manage 15 people at once which means i'm gonna have to do three times the amount of the amount of characters for npcs and like <coughs> absolutely not <laughs> like that's funny like i'm i'm crazy but i'm not that crazy <laughs> but of course of course some um, in doing in doing the even this is this is the reason why I um as as cute as it is to see stuff to see stuff like Critical Role I would I I would always caution voice actors for in doing g in doing GMing because because um it's for, w there's probably going to be an even bigger expectation to do a bunch of different voices than ju than just some rando like me. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right, 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 right. But. When when it comes to when it comes when it comes to um accents, that was always one of the tr that was always one of the tricky ones, one of the tricky cases to try and do. Um, have uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, you know it's interesting. I teach dialects in my master class, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a you know doing doing uh, doing dialects is is it's just a practice. It's just a skill. You just get you just get good at it, and you start with. A couple of subtle change, a couple of very simple subtle changes, and you you focus on one or two changes because typically what makes a dialect or an accent sound fake is not what you're not doing right, but what you think you're doing right, but is actually wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, eighty percent um, of eighty ninety percent of the words and sounds you use you know for instance like in a british or or a russian or or irish about eighty percent of what you do is going to sound exactly the same as it does in your native uh, american mm -hmm. um it's it's only ten or fifteen percent that needs to change for it to read properly as the other accent so it's really about finding the least amount of changes you can do to accomplish the yeah. dialect to make it nice and um usable and flexible and and because a lot of times people will be able to do a character voice in a dialect but they can't do the dialect in different character voices mm -hmm. so they you know you have to you have to have know what you're doing to change and then uh, keep those changes consistent yeah and i will certainly take um shifting accents over having to talk fast there's a, there's been a few times where I've had to go auctioneer kind of fast, which I have no idea how those guys do it. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's a very uh, a, a very specific thing they do. And and uh, for speaking fast, what it is is um, and and I know this from poetry and poetry slams and and hip hop and. It's about relaxing the jaw and not trying to involve the jaw mm -hmm. as much in the speech. So, uh, uh, and the jaw is just a, uh, you can kind of use the jaw, but not for every, uh, it, it's like a, if you disengage the jaw and just try to do the speech right here at the front of your mouth, you, you can move a lot more quickly. Mm -hmm. It's when you start having that jaw involved that it becomes... If you ever watch those auctioneers, their 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 mouth doesn't move at all. They just sit here right here and it's talking right here. You know, like it's yeah. barely, barely moving. Um, that's because it's all happening with mostly the tongue, and and the lips. So, that's what. Uh, oddly enough, what helped was because I, I've I've taken I've taken some acting classes, obviously, but um, with a lot of the, with a lot of stuff that I ended up employing, a lot of it was self-taught. Um, right. I I did end up watching a lot of auctioneers, obviously, but I also the th the thing that helped was actually was actually trying to re trying to read through tongue twisters. Yeah, yeah, hundred, yeah. That is one of the things I harp on for my students is that you can become an Olympic level speaker if you just practice a t the same tongue twister every time you take a shower, every time you're in the bathroom, every time you're doing dishes, whatever you do, and that's. Uh, subroutines we call mm -hmm. it you you pick out your routines that you already have and then you add something to mm -hmm. it uh, and uh, if you pick one tongue twister she stood on the balcony and explicably mimicking and hiccuping and amicably welcoming him in and you make that your tongue twister that you're going to work on for the next week or two weeks or month 
uh, you will become an expert at it. Mm -hmm. And if you refresh it every once in a while, it's not really ever going to go away. Mm -hmm. And you can keep adding variety. She sells seashells. You can uh, toy boat, toy boat, mm -hmm. unique New York. You can you can start going through all of them. And then as you build up your repertoire of different tongue twisters, then you can build up a repertoire of tongue twisters in a row. So you're saying Peggy Babcock toy boat, Peggy Babcock, Peggy Babcock toy boat, toy boat, Peggy Babcock, Peggy Babcock, Peggy Babcock toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat. And you work through a whole, um, you know, sort of... Uh, a sonnet of tongue twisters and uh, a Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare. That's another one that will get you uh, your your diction in in fine shape because he moves all over the place. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the tongue twisters are a great base skill for all of acting and speaking. Mm -hmm. And it's it's one of those things where the it's always it's always interesting seeing the mechanisms because. Um, storytelling has has always been my big has always been my big thing. Um, I can I can blame those years in the library to the point where I ended up getting a spare set of keys as as a half joke. It's <laughs> <laughs> like it because he kept he he kept seeing me in there every day every day for weeks on end. So he's like, "You're in here so much, I may as well get you may as well live here." And I'm I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, whatever." Then a week later, he gives me a set of keys. He's like, "Don't burn the place down while I'm while I'm not here." And I spent the time just going through every single book in that place over the span of three months, and That's and awesome. all of that stuff is st is still a, is still crammed into my head for some reason. But that's the uh, that's the best, man. Li I am sad that libraries aren't really. They used to be such a magical place, especially when I was had young children, and we were very poor. And they had videos finally and DVDs eventually, but just the books, you know, the kids all had their own library card and it was like going to a beautiful store and everybody went home with a bunch of stuff to read or movies to watch, documentaries, nature shows. And, mm -hmm. you know, there was something magical to that, that now you can, you know, Almost, you can literally watch everything that's ever been recorded or filmed from your phone, mm -hmm. driving down the highway, you know, in the back seat. We just did a big, long family trip, and, you know, screens were were useful in the trip. It keeps keeps kids occupied in that closed environment. And uh, <clears throat> But I don't know. There's lots of studies that say boredom is good for you it's that's how you create your creative engine uh and how you construct your your creative engine and and uh your your interior life is created from boredom i haven't been bored in i don't know i'd like to say f maybe 40 years maybe when i was 12 or 13 i was bored but you know it's a thing that that eventually goes away uh it's boredom is really a childhood thing. And it's as that creativity is growing inside you that you're, you know, becoming part of it. I've part of the cr creative world. I've always had, I've always had more creativity than passion, than common sense. And <laughs> give, given, given the places that I grew up, I would, there, I would find, I would find ways to improvise. Um, even, even if, the, even if that meant, if that meant if that meant um do, doing doing things with my bike that I'm not, that I'm probably not supposed to <laughs> or <laughs> or um or j or j or um find or finding going through going through book going through books games and the like and finding interesting little ch interesting little challenges that I, that I can put myself through with with them um I do. I remember. I remember when we, when the family had st stuff like stuff like Uno, and I had this little book of house rules, and I main I maintain that nobody plays Uno, um, rules as written. Everybody's got their own little house rules that they play. It's true. It's true. It's true. If you ever, we read the rule. We got. We hadn't played Uno in a while, and and we had gotten a new pack. Um, and somebody made the mistake of reading the rules, and we were like, "Oh, that's terrible. Let's play. <laughs> like, let's play it the way we wa we've always played." Yeah. Or, oh, um, I met I 
I used I used an egg timer once and for to make a custom setup for a game of Jenga to make Jenga even more torture. Because <laughs> I'm Perfect. I maintain that Jenga should be listed as a form of torturing non-combatants. <laughs> if you've if you've played Jenga, especially late game Jenga, you know exactly the kind of pain I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, just it's really high up. There's one. There's one. There's one brick in, in a row, and everybody's like, nobody breathe, nobody sneeze, nobody cough, <laughs> and just pray that when you move the thing, it doesn't it doesn't fall over. Because if it falls over, it's your fault. That's true. But I do I I do know we're we're kind of getting getting close to the time frame that you had, that you had mentioned. I do want to sincerely thank That's you. That's true. For yeah, for coming to, for coming all the way to my temple, and I, it, anytime you're open to it, I'd love to have you be, back on for for a bit for a bit more protracted of a discussion, or to or to to share share moments of learning between between us because I spend way too much time teaching people, and I think that's something we can both relate to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is nice just to have the sort of intellectual uh, banter back and forth. Mm -hmm. A lot of I mean you. you uh, 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 the philosophy of things is always more interesting interesting to me than uh, what happened. You know, what happened is sort of base level. Uh, and a lot of times we get on podcasts and they just kind of, what happened? And you got to do a little bit of that, tell people how you got there. But then the, I really appreciate these types of discussions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more interesting, yeah. more fun. Well, this is this is the kind of thing I do all the, all the time in my temple in one form or another. Sometimes we're reconstructing missed opportunities in storytelling sometimes we're flirting with we're flirting with game design and sometimes we're um we're picking on certain um traditions in the in either that uh, that kind that kind of annoy us <laughs> but it but it's all yeah, well good i would be happy to come back anytime mm -hmm. for sure yep and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>